there's a few studies out there um, around, for example, um, kind of over empathizing with a parent that doesn't like a certain subject. And, and we tend to actually to over empathize with the same sex parent. And we even do this with teachers. So having, you know, a primary school teacher that's uncomfortable with math or doesn't like it or you get that feeling can actually have an impact on how you see it. Likewise, sitting down with a parent that says things like, oh, this was always my work subject. And I know it's really hard, honey. It's kind of like trying to get your kid to eat vegetables and kind of pulling the face and going, oh, these vegetables are disgusting, but you have to eat them. So obviously, you know, from a base psychological point of view, we learn vicariously through observing others. And if the message is, I'm doing this, but I really hate doing this, um, then it kind of becomes normalized. And I think that's a big part of, I think, the problem. I think the other part of the problem is, you know, this notion that, you know, th there's almost kind of like this flip and pride of saying, oh, yeah, I'm just, ugh, I'm terrible at math. Like, we, we really wouldn't say, like, oh, I'm terrible at reading or I hate reading, you know, not in the same vein. So it's almost... Dare I say, it's not necessarily, you know, I don't know if cool is too strong a word, but it's certainly acceptable to kind of say, meh, don't really want to do that. And of course, then we have from a really base sort of, you know, educational psychology uh, level, the, the issue of the less invested I'm in something, the less good I become at it, the less good I become at it, then obviously that sort of reinforces and we get that vicious cycle. I think there was a couple of things. I think one of the things that I was very aware of when Jesse was growing up is um, how, especially little girls, tend to be validated for things that don't really matter. So, you know, I think we tend to see a little girl and go, aren't you cute or aren't you pretty? And one of the things when people would say that, I would always say, because she used to do judo at the time, say she's amazing at judo and amazing at math. And I would do this for a couple of reasons. I think the first one was this idea of like, sometimes the most interesting thing about you, Jesse, is a thing that people can't see. But the other thing was also like, I want you to invest in your physicality. I want you to invest in your intelligence. And and obviously she she loved numbers kind of, you know, early on and and you kind of spot that in your kid and sort of you reinforce it and I think it was um interestingly enough her father and, and her would kind of bond over over and they would actually argue about how to do little things so I think they, they had this cute little relationship there but for for me the point was also when things got tough we were very big on coming out of your comfort zone I think that's the other thing with education in general like you're not supposed to rock up at school and find everything super easy like that that that's really not the, not the point the point is you rock up you find things hard until you find a way to figure them out and again that reinforcing of I think, you know, I always say it's sort of action versus outcome. So the reinforcement of, of the action of trying harder, looking at it differently, getting, you know, support, asking people versus what grade did you get? And that's, I think, the other thing that we did. So whenever we kind of, you know, rewarded as parents doing well, I, we'd always reward for studying or for working or for trying a different thing rather than when she got the grade. Because I think that's the other big thing, right? So sometimes you work really hard and the grade doesn't come right away. And I think... You, you, when you attach those two, it becomes problematic, the reward for the outcome rather than the action. I think at its basest level, anxiety is anticipating that, you know, you have to cope with something and you don't have the resources to cope with it, right? So something's going to happen and I'm not going to be able to do this. And that kind of makes us feel worried and inadequate and might make us feel low and might make us feel agitated. Now, the way that we tend to contend with anxiety actually feeds into the problem because the underside of anxiety is avoidance. If I'm anxious about dogs, <laughs> excuse me, I stay away from dogs. If I'm anxious about maths, I stay away from math. And actually, the solution becomes part of the problem. Precisely when I'm afraid of dogs, of public speaking, of maths, is when I should be edging towards it. Now, of course, you can do this incrementally. You can do this in a really sort of, you know, small, slow way. But the point is coming out of your comfort zone because the only way, the only way we increase confidence in anything in life is doing the thing we never thought we could do. So, um, and, and again, I think the instinct that we have as parents, and I know this, the minute our child says, oh, I don't like this, you're like, okay, well, let's try something else. That's the moment where you kind of, that, that instinct 
needs to be challenged. You need to be like, okay, well, sometimes, you know, we don't like things for the wrong reasons, right? You don't have to be the best at something to like it. I think that's a really important point as well. I mean, I'm a god awful singer. I still enjoy singing. And, you know, and also this idea of overcoming, because then that feeds into your identity, right? So, oh, I didn't think I could do this, but now I can. So, kind of sticking with it and coming out of that comfort zone is the way generally speaking to kind of um, avoid that anxiety or challenge it. I think the first thing that's critical is this idea that we need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? Um, And actually confidence is a really interesting one. You know the saying, fake it till you make it. It really works because people can't tell the difference between genuine confidence and someone who's just standing with their shoulders back and kind of making good eye contact. You know, confidence um, is is something that can be emulated. And interestingly enough, you get that positive feedback loop when you do emulate it. So I think that's the first thing, the idea that um, I'm going to get comfortable with you know, being, you know, uncomfortable and kind of rest assured that if I do certain things, eventually it gets easier. The second one is having, I think, realistic goals, right? If I'm terrible at math, I'm not going to sit down going from not having done it for years to doing sort of university level math. I'm going to start incrementally doing it and I'm going to give myself the best chance of succeeding or approximating to our success. And I'll mark that. We know that kind of marking it, even like I'm telling someone, right? We know that accountability and just those kind of basic rewards, right? We know that token economies work from the youngest kids right up through to kind of people getting bonuses at huge banks just because it's an acknowledgement of what you've done. So you mark when you've done well. Um, You have clear goals. That's a good one, right? So this is what I'm trying to do. And, and I think critically, um, it's about kind of understanding as well that there is always room for improvement. And the way that we do that is we focus on, like I said earlier, action versus outcome. That's a huge one because improvement is very rarely like that. It's like this, right? So those moments where you're having that dip, you're not going to be like, oh, that's it. I knew I was awful. You need to understand that, this, you know, this sounds like a sort of cat poster slogan, but it's true. Success is a part of failure. Any successful person I've ever worked with, you know, it's an approximation of, of, of smaller and bigger failures to get to the point that you want. So if you're embarking on any new skill, math or, you know, running a 5K, it's not, you know, never going to be a black and white thing. It's going to be those little approximations and you need to see the failures as part of the success. The answer is absolutely. In the same way, that kind of negative thinking style can be really Uh, contaminating other parts of your life. You go from like, you know, I don't like this, you know, part of my life to I don't like anything about my life. In the same way, confidence feeds into other things, right? So people tend to respond to it very much. You then tend to see yourself as not as somebody you know, it's that open, you know, it's that growth mindset, all that wonderful research by, you know, Professor Dress, that kind of idea of like, you know what, there's always, you know, room to grow and asking questions. And as you say, maybe I, you know, I get a little embarrassed because it was a silly question. That's fine. Room to grow. And once you have that mindset, it's very easy to kind of transfer that mindset from something as relatively, I guess, straightforward as getting the right or wrong answer in math to kind of being able to take that risk and go for that job or ask out that cute girl or guy on the date or whatever the case may be, because it is beautifully self-perpetuating. And and also, I think, speaks to kind of um, what we kind of aim for in life. I think far too many times in life, I think we aim for Things that sound good on paper, right? We, we aim for happiness or ease, but actually we need to, to aim for adventure and we need to aim for, aim for purpose and meaning. And while this isn't always easy or even joyful in the moment, we know that in the long run, this really feeds into our sense of self, into our view of the world and our expectations about life and just makes it much more positive. <laughs>